All right, so let's get this out of the way. Um, this is probably all you need for this talk. Um, you, if you wanna just take the word of somebody who's on stage, Russ is ready for production, we can move on. Um, if you need to be further sold, or if you have coworkers or employers that, that kind of need a little more information than somebody on stage saying yes, um, that's kind of, that's, that's my reason for being here. Um, so uh, my name is, is Fletcher. Um, you, can get, you can reach me at all these places on the internet, which is like blue on black, um, which isn't terribly good. Um, I'll have the slide deck up afterwards, and I'll, I have it on my, my lanyard. And if you see me today, I look like this. Um, uh, so I, I'm here, um, I guess, by way of the project that I've been working on for almost the last two years um, called Habitat. Uh, we kind of publicly launched this uh, in June last year, so it's coming up on its one year anniversary of kind of being in the open. Um, we were working on it for almost a year sort of in stealthy mode, always knowing that we were gonna flip the open source bit at the end and do the kind of big reveal. So the entire project is, is open source and it's under the Apache V2 license. So there's, um, Right now, there's not really any private repos that we have. We have one for some of our infrastructure for like the little bit of Terraform we need, and the rest is uh, there for you to see. So um, this talk isn't exactly about Habitat, but I thought I would try to do the like two-minute version um, of, of what Habitat is. It's, it's a large thing. It's a large code base. Um, so really, at its core, um, it's, it's a... It's a runtime system that helps your apps. So if, if it's like a Ruby app or a Go app, or other services and software like the Postgres database or Redis or, or something like that. Um, and it's a, it's a way to help coordinate those, those running services with each other and um, amongst themselves to like um, facilitate leader election and discovering services and do reliable um, upgrades and like rolling releases. And um, it also provides uh, real-time um, service configuration, so if I need to change the, uh, the mode or the behavior of my, my application kind of um, live, like I need to bring something offline or I need to rotate a key, there's a way to kind of um, dynamically apply new configuration in, in a, a way that would be like a software upgrade and again have your, um, your services react to that in an appropriate way. And um, finally, it, it also um, uh, includes a build system. Um, which helps you to kind of wrap your package up in a kind of deterministic way that captures all of the requirements that your app needs, all the software that it needs to run, um, all the software that it needed to build itself, and then at runtime, any services that it might depend on that it might need to get its work done. Um, it, uh, so this, uh, this is something that I've been kind of focused on uh, for the last few weeks and will be for a while. Um, I wanna make sure that Habitat loves your apps. Um, we've, we've been doing lots of work to make sure that we have sort of a baseline of software and services ready, um, but I have been interested in Habitat for running my software, and um, that's what we want to provide to everybody else. Um, and uh, the, the large parts, most of the, the code base happens to be in Rust, which is, uh, which is why I'm here. Um, so our website kind of looks like this, and again, this blue and black. Um, should, should have caught that at, at edit time, but um, again, the slides will be online. It's uh, habitat.sh, and .sh, why? Well, there's some shell code in there, too. <laughs> so, um, so why Rust? Why choose Rust for, for a new project like this, especially one that uh, grew to be somewhat large, um, uh, something that we were working on for a long time um, that we weren't guaranteed was you know, gonna resonate with people, um, so why do we take a chance on, on Rust? Um, this question comes up quite a lot. Uh, it's something, if I go to a conference, um, especially with other developers, and if there's programming languages around, um, this is almost just comes up like, so why did you write it in Rust? Um, so the, there's, there's a few reasons for it. Um, some of the history uh, going back, the original kind of idea and the, the prototype of what Habitat became, um, was written by the chef founder, Adam Jacob, um, had wrote some of the original stuff. Um, I came in, um, basically myself and one other developer, and the three of us worked on it for a while and kind of took it forward to, to a certain point, and then we grew the team from there. Um, but the original code base was written in Rust, and so at the heart of Habitat is this um, process supervisor, so we, we call it the supervisor, 
Um, and if we need a, a short way to describe it, we just uh, do SUP. I like to pronounce that soup, and I always think of a can of soup. Um, so th this, at its core, is like supervising another uh, process, or it's like spawning a child, and that child happens to be your application or, your, or a service or something like that. So if um, anybody has uh, used other like system init processes or process supervisors, um, these tend to be written in C at the end of the day. Um, kind of doesn't matter how new or old it is. Um, it's a C or C++ kind of code base. Um, and there's lots of good reasons for this. Um, and similar things we wanted with, uh, with Habitat is a, a supervisor that doesn't hopefully consume more memory than the process it's supervising and like will you know, eat up all that memory. Um, it needs to be kind of fast and responsive to react to the, the needs of uh, the application that it's, it's, uh, it's helping to supervise, but also um, from events that might be happening out in the, in the kind of the ring in the, in the larger world. Um, it's also, uh, this is also um, a place where pro other programming languages can sometimes get in the way. Um, what we need to do um, at some point is actually call some kind of fork and exec or handle Unix signals or do the equivalent in Windows and um, this has been something that um, Rust has been um, amazing for, is having higher levels when it's useful and being able to drop down to be like directly talking to what you need to talk to with really nothing in your way or you don't really need to fight through the language. Um, and, and, and lastly, um, it would be great if the thing that's um, keeping your application up doesn't itself crash. Um, so it needs to be about as stable as we can make it. Um, You'll notice there's a lot of overlap with kind of virtues of Rust, so they kind of map so well. Um, that was some of the original reason behind it, and it's really been, um, I have like zero regrets <laughs> with, with living in this code base as a result. Um, so we have a lot more um, software in, in Habitat now, um, and that's just sort of grown over time because as we sort of grew the code base and split libraries off and made other components and services, um, you start to get these small libraries, you know, some code to parse our package identifiers and to install packages and um, do these sorts of things. So after a certain point, making the little web service to, you know, handle an upload, like you've already got 30% of the functionality in these little reusable libraries, so it's easy to just write a little bit more Rust. And um, this wasn't, I think, originally where we thought things would go, um, but it's actually been really great to have um, kind of one dominant language throughout the code base. So f for new contributors, if they've got one language, they're, they're basically kind of ready to go, whether that's just client-side tooling or the process supervisor or dealing with our, with our gossip implementation or doing web programming on like our back-end build service. Um, it's kind of all the same language. Um, this was sort of an added bonus for me was the um, kind of uh, using Rust to make CLI or console-based tools. Um, it is uh, very good um, at making, um, you know, compile targets for different systems. Um, we're not using a lot of cross-compilation right now in the Habitat project. Um, we're largely doing builds on the native platforms, so our uh, sort of main Habitat program, we're doing compiles on uh, Linux and Mac and Windows. Um, and it, it feels really good and you get really nice um, kind of output at, at the end. Um, so for the, the sort of the main parts of, of Habitat that are written in Rust, we have our, our supervisor, this um, Hab CLI or program. So it would be the thing that you would download onto your laptop to start playing with it or to build packages locally or the things that you would install like on a server or in a container um, to like spawn the supervisor and get your software installed. So it's kind of like it's, it's the small seed, it's the small seed we could get that like germinates into whatever Habitat environment you kind of need. Um, and we also have this distributed um, build system that knows um, about the, how to make Habitat packages and how to do like recompiles of things in, in a, a proper order and that kind of thing. Um, we also have a, um, a package hosting repository because we have sort of a packaging system, so you gotta put those somewhere, and that's our depot service that's kind of part of Builder. And it's a, it's a growing code base. I took this, I think this week, um, trying to figure out how many lines of Rust code. There are some um, generated Rust code, which is like 
I, I guess it's sort of we're responsible for it, but like you regenerate it and forget it. So it's not to say that a human being has uh, written like 80,000 lines of Rust code, but we're probably in the 40 to 50,000 line range would be my guess. Um, so uh, we're using kind of Rust to our advantage in, in a few places. Um, so one of them is uh, our ability to use uh, native libraries. So by that, I, I mean, um, libraries that may not have been written in Rust and that might be well known for the functionality that, that they provide. And this is um, sometimes a complicated thing depending on the language that you choose, whether this is an easy thing to do or is really hard or if you, uh, in the worst case, incur like a cost to actually um, use something that's not like in a managed runtime. So in Habitat, um, we're using the libarchive project when we're extracting our package format, it's you know like in a compressed tarball format like under the, the covers. And we you know we do some extraction and some streaming to read metadata and that kind of thing. Um, all our crypto stuff we're using um, uh, libsodium for generating keys and doing symmetric encryption for, for our gossip stuff. Um, the only th place we're not using um, libsodium for at the moment is uh, talking to SSL enabled web servers. Um, we use zero MQ in a few places um, in our gossip system. That's how we get the um, the kind of configuration updates. So I called this rumor propagation. If anyone's done any gossip stuff, that's that's how we're doing our rumor propagation. Um, and to communicate with some of the backend service stuff between the components and route messages. Um, so there is some open SSL in there. Um, we have been whittling that down over time. Um, right now, its only function is to talk to TLS or SSL-enabled web servers, and that's really our build depot and GitHub, I think, right now. So I've got this on my, my to-do list to uh, um, replace this with Rust TLS, and then we can drop open SSL as a dependency. So anytime there's a vulnerability, um, the Habitat project is rebuilding and making new OpenSL packages for everybody else so that they become vulnerability free, but it'll be great that we don't additionally have to like build ours first to give people like a refresh set. Um, so um, static compilation is another thing that um, ended up being a killer feature that I don't think, um, I don't know how much attention it, it gets. It was something I spent an awfully long time on at a certain point. Because we were doing this kind of in secret, it was something I wanted and it was tricky to figure out. I know that some people have now blogged about it, which is, which is great. Um, uh, so uh, you don't necessarily need to understand everything on here, um, but normally the way that you would build a, a Rust crate or, or a project is with the, the cargo build, and if you're doing this for production release, you just add the dash dash release, which um, does uh, a few things. Um, what you get at the end, I'm just calling the, the file program on, on Linux, so it's, it's basically getting me the, um, the, the binary format and some of the characteristics about it so I can tell what it is. Um, and you can see that it's, uh, it's a dynamically linked binary, which, uh, which means that there are some um, shared libraries that will be, they have to be uh, found somewhere on disk and then loaded. Um, there's a, there's the, the dynamic linker from libc that, that we're using to load those things. And, um, and the LDD script is, is another program from Bin Utils that can sort of show um, where all these libraries live and if, if some of them aren't found and which libraries need other libraries and that kind of thing. So you can see even like our simple binary has a bunch and I've omitted the rest. Um, so this is where um, Muscle comes in um, for us to sort of help with this static um, compilation thing. So. Um, Muscle is um, it's a uh, libc implementation, so similar to um, glibc or, or similar kind of things. It's supposed to be most-ish compatible. Um, by and large, it's it's pretty good. It's used in some um, more popular um, smaller um, OSs, so a lot of like uh, smaller like router-based um, OSs. I know Alpine Linux uses that as its libc core and that kind of thing. Um, and an awesome thing about this is uh, with the Rust compiler, um, they have this concept of like a target triple. So it kind of, from my understanding is it kind of comes from the LVM uh, target triple. So normally um, in Linux, you'd have the um, uh, Linux dash GNU, I think, for the, 
for the um, glibc ABI stuff. Um, there's a special target, though, for muscle. And by default, what you get from that is static uh, builds. Um, so there's extra th stuff you need to do. You need to either compile or install muscle on the system. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to have your libraries also compiled against that. Um, that's what we do in Habitat. Um, you can get by, though, sometimes without it. It just gets, it gets a little weird. Um, and really, the only thing you're doing on the end is adding this dash dash target with, with the, the, the target triple when you're doing your, your compile build, which is mostly true. It's not exactly true. So this is kind of a, an example for our Habitat um, binary. And we, we use a few um, native libraries. And so these environment variables are effectively feeding the, the build scripts for all the, the crates that we're using to like find the libraries in the right place. Um, and a few of them are accepting this like static flag, so they pass the right things down to Rust C, which goes through to the linker and that kind of thing. And what you get at the end, if you call file on the same thing, is um, this statically linked um, line in, in file, which uh, the first time I got that, I was like so excited. Um, because then you, you try LDD and you see like, it's not a dynamic executable. There's nothing else that it needs. Um, and kind of at the end, um, this is after our Habitat build system, um, by default, we'll call um, strip at the end to do just further crunching down and removing of uh, things. So we get kind of like an 8 megabyte-ish binary out of it that um, you can drop on any 64-bit Linux, at least for, for this one, that's like the Linux kernel, I can't remember, 2.6.32 or something and, and up, and it basically works, which is um, pretty awesome. Um, so I would say for, for people who have um, looked at Go for exactly this kind of thing, like a static relocatable binary, um, you can totally do this in Rust. Um, it's just not like you know the, the top three like feature set. Um, so um, we do a few things different in the Habitat project than I've seen in some of the other ones, and there's some kind of reasons why. So one of the patterns that, that we're doing, um, and this is a, a bit of a reaction to other projects that we've been involved with in the past, especially ones with like many, many code bases and um, in a really early stage project. Um, we kind of right now have like almost all of Habitat is in one Git repo, which might scare some people. But um, definitely when we're working on new features or stabilizing things or refactoring, it is so nice. Um, so this is kind of a directory listing in, in our Habitat projects. We have a directory called components, which will either map to like a Rust crate or a, a binary program, but it might be like our Habitat Studio is actually written in like BusyBox uh, shellcode, um, which nobody knows because it's just, um, we've kind of hidden that, that requirement away from you. So most people don't know that or, or care. We've got like there's a Ruby gem in there and a few other things. So these are largely Rust crates with a cargo.toml, but not all of them are. Um, and um, this has helped us uh, when we're doing builds with like the supervisor and the CLI. Like we have lots of common dependencies, um, including internal you know uh, crates of our own. Um, and there's this nice feature. I can't remember when this landed, but I remember when we found out we were using Cargo Nightly for just a little while to get um, this Cargo Workspaces feature, um, which is a way to have um, more than one like Rust crate share a common lock file and then put all their sort of build output in, in one shared directory. So it means that you're, in theory, only building that crate once for the benefit of like everything else that you're building along. Um, so our, our cargo.toml in the root of our project is, uh, it's, it's a little strange. It's just got this workspaces entry with a members list, and it's basically all the Rust crates um, uh, that, that we've got under there. Um, and then in, this is one of our crates um, underneath. Um, so a line four, or sorry, five, the, the, the last line um, just shows like a parent directory, a couple parent directories up to say like this is my, my workspace route where the cargo lock is and where I want all the, the build stuff to go. And um, that has, I can't remember what that did to our build times, but it was like a 4x speed up over what we were getting for, for stuff. Um, and th that's why we were consuming nightly for a little bit um, on that. Um, so similar, we've taken lots of, uh, tried to model lots of patterns and ideas off um, the, the Rust core. 
uh, team and the way that they do releases. Um, so uh, our the the stuff that isn't kind of like server side service stuff, um, we're we're doing basically a ro rolling release style of like. Um, we try to do on a regular enough cadence, just do a release, and when stuff is there and ready, it's good. And if there's a feature that's not quite ready, if we can feature flag it and sort of like land it and enable it when we want, um, that's been working pretty nice. What it means is most of these uh, components, though, we just we want them to share the same version because it's kind of like the same set of, of packages at the end. Um, so we ended up doing this with a little bit of, this has taken us a little bit of work. We used to have the same version in our, all these cargo.toml, so our release was like editing a lot of these files and not forgetting one. Um, what we're doing now, though, is um, basically using a common um, build script, um, which is a little Rust program that gets built before the rest of your crate gets compiled so you can do um, super interesting, fun stuff. Um, and you don't necessarily need to understand all um, the Rust code, but um, basically what we're doing is just checking for an environment variable, which in our build system for building our components, we're actually injecting a more um, complete version string. So it's sort of like the AB or the XYZ semantic version and then a release um, like timestamp. So that would be like a fully qualified habitat package version, which is what I want to see when I like download that from a Habitat package. But in development, I just care about like the XYZ version. Um, so that environment variable allows us to like inject a, a, a better version at kind of release time. And otherwise, we just fall back to this read version um, function. And then we write that, that string out to just a, a file in this outdoor directory. And that's just something that Cargo provides with an environment variable. So you can have a place that you can like pick up files later um, once you've once you've built this when you're when you're doing your compilation, and um, the read version is is basically just reading um, a, f a plain text file a couple directories up. It's just called version for us, and it just reads the contents, and that's our like semantic version. Um, and then in our in our code base, um, we can set up a constant and use um, the, uh, a couple. Um, uh, nice macros, which basically allow you to like inline a string, and we're just can, um, we're just basically catting that version file out into a into a string. So that happens at build time, and it bakes it into the binary. And it's so awesome to have like that dynamic ability, but still it gets like statically baked in. Um, so for our our crate dependencies, we, we're also bucking a little bit of a trend, and I, I thought it'd be worth spending a second to, to explain. Um, if, if you're interested in Habitat and then you go looking in our crates, you're going to see like an awful lot of just wildcard stars, and you're going to say, that is not what you're supposed to do. Um, which I think, it, normally speaking, yes, um, that is not probably what you should be doing. And I think there are some linting, especially on crates. I think when you publish, it will warn you and say, like, you probably shouldn't do this. Um, what we're doing, though, under the, the hood, um, again, sharing that one lock file, um, which is being versioned along with our software, is this is l thinking of our code base less as a library and more as like an application in that sense. Um, this allows us to be a little bit more aggressive when we um, uh, update our dependencies, um, which, yeah, so our, our dependency um, strategy is, I would call it aggressive. Um, so uh, all this really means, this is just a, um, a, a screenshot of the history of our um, Rust plan that builds our Rust package for Habitat. Um, and uh, so Rust releases are like every six weeks, you get like a Christmas present, which is like some new goodies for, for Rust. So um, it's a bit of a game, I think, in our project, or maybe it's only my game, is I try to be the first one to get us like our updated plan and build that so that we have new Rust. And we have frequently done releases of Habitat around the same day as a Rust release. And we will like just put the new version of Rust in and compile and, and like do a release off that. Um, we started using Rust, I know, before 1.6.0, only because it went that far back in version control. And I have a feeling we used earlier versions. And I don't think we've been burned once. Like, typically, all we see is more compiler warnings. Um, and we're incentivized to f clean those up, and then, and then we're kind of good after that. Um, and similarly, this is r way too small, but this is basically um, a periodic test that we do, which is doing like a cargo update on like the whole project. 
and then pulling in whatever is the newest and latest and then dealing with um, any kind of API fixes. So um, uh, Jamie, who's on the team, did this this week, and I think there was a couple, a couple uh, like uh, crates that went 1.0. Um, we got lucky because uh, the survey update. I don't think there was anything that we had to change, um, which was which was awesome. We, we spent a little bit of time, I think, with the 08 to 09 upgrade, and it was like totally worth it. It just took a little bit longer, but we we try to continually eat that pain, um, which actually over time there's not a lot of pain. Um, so we will liberally use a lot of uh, crate dependencies, and it's been working really, really well for us. Um, I think I'm going to skip this cross-platform, uh, other than to say um, it works really well, and the uh, compiled-in attributes, um, which kind of look like uh, this with the little um, pound CFG, um, work really good. If you, um, if you model your... Um, uh, structure your code in a way similar to like the Rust project. I, I basically just copied what I saw in the standard library in Rust itself for like, how would I do something only on Windows and not impact like the Mac build? And um, a lot of like patterns calling a, maybe an inner function or an inner module, um, that's, that's worked pretty well. We just try to centralize where a lot of that stuff lives so that we don't have um, like pound configs, like littering our code everywhere, and in conditionals, we just try to keep it module and in as few places as possible. So, um, so another big thing that um, it's it's a it's it's a challenge for the Rust community as much as it is for Habitat is um, we want more people working on Habitat and contributing to it. Um, so with with that large, you know, often new team members are learning a new language, and when I say team members. Um, we have some active um, core maintainers right now uh, that aren't um, working at the same company that I'm at that might not even be on the same continent. So these people are in the same boat. Um, we've just found that some of these people, they sort of come out of the blue and have already had that interest and are landing like pull request fixes and we're going, whoa, that's awesome. Um, so we are trying to figure out better ways um, to bring people in even before that point, so when they're kind of learning and, and wanting to ask questions, um, because not everybody can go from like, I've not heard of you before, and now you're an active uh, member of our community like three weeks later. Um, so I think that the problem that a lot of people have when they're learning Rust or looking at Habitat or, or trying to be productive um, is, I kind of felt this way too, that. I, if I'm kind of getting into this code base, I sort of have to be able to land this dive in like my first week, um, or else I'm like letting my team down or I'm not being productive. Um, so this is something that we work really hard to try and um, avoid. Um, and the, the, the best advice I can give, which is not all that insightful, is just give these people the time and the support to like learn and experiment and to, um, help them to figure this out in whatever way works best for them. And, and everybody kind of learns differently. Um, so I have here, like, to, to pair on feature work. Um, that can work really well for some people and can be either intimidating or actively, like, destructive for somebody else's way of thinking. And we have people on our team who absolutely love pairing, and we have other people who can barely cope with... with um, too many people like talking and typing at the same time. Like people just have different ways of, of learning. So um, we're trying to be like aware and conscious of that, especially when you're in a learning mode. Um, and um, you know, uh, I guess Habitat's my day job, and it is some people's day job. Which means when you're coming onto the team, you want to feel like you're an active contributing member as quickly as possible. I think a lot of people want to feel like they're they're. Um, they're making an impact, and as far as I'm concerned, as long as like you're learning and getting your head around it and asking questions, like you are being productive, um, and to try to make sure people feel like they have that space and, and don't have to be like landing big feature changes like three days in. Some people do though, and that's the way they learn. So um, kind of to each their own. Um, it's also been helpful for the particular parts of the code base to um, talk with people around sort of like how that code sees the world. Um, so like our supervisor, for example, is uh, paranoid and distrusting of other things and is trying to be defensive of everything, trying to destroy it um, or to influence it in some way. So there are, um, you know, we kind of make, 
we, we think about things like unwraps and expects um, a lot more closely than we might in other places. There are like totally legitimate and good times to use unwrap and expect, and then there's others in certain contexts where like you might not want to do that. Um, you're basically making an assertion that's so strong, that you're saying like as a developer, my expectation is so strong that this is going to be true that if I'm not right, We'll just let the program like unwind and die if you're like in the main loop, and that might be okay because that might be a legitimate failure. Or if you're on a thread that's not the main thread, it might actually be great to like actively kill that thing before it does further harm. So it depends, and that's why, um, especially when you're learning these things, you'll see a lot of examples that use. Um, I've seen a lot that use unwrap, and I've seen a lot more now that use expect. And there was a while where we went kind of crazy with expect until we really thought about. This is just like a nicer form of unwrap, so we need to be just as careful with expect as we are with unwrap. Um, and really on both sides, just to be patient, because um, uh, working, with, working with Rust gets really, really good. Um, the, the more time you kind of put in, um, I sort of feel like it, it took me a few months to sort of feel like I was halfway competent and, and longer to like was sort of hitting my stride and um, there was a leveling up point where I was starting to, I was starting to uh, figure out like how do I get rid of these clones because I know like I don't really need this twice. So like when you kind of reach that point where you're sort of able to think about like the memory that you might be wasting, like nobody has to think about that at the start. Um, but I know on our team, that's that's usually a sign that like um, they've sort of been at it, um, a, 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 you know, enough to be at a sort of like a certain. Um, level and like again not everyone really needs to be at that point and there's a few of us that um, if it is more critical in our code reviews that we might um, use that as a learning opportunity. Um, so I, I'm going to quickly go through the pain points and then I think we'll call it because we're probably at time here. Um, so this is a, a problem that um, gets actually much better over time, that Rust has gotten a lot quicker to compile. The problem is in Habitat we keep adding code and complexity and finding about these amazing things like traits which like add complexity to the compiler. So we're kind of like always in a race, I find, but um, for stuff like, you know, doing multiple compiles, stuff like um, workspaces helps. Um, the single most important thing you can do to avoid this is keep using um, latest stable or if you want um, uh, nightly and you're going to basically get the benefit of um, of the compiler getting better all the time. So like don't stick on one version of, of Rust, just like keep upgrading if you can. Um, the cross-platform stuff is not usually a problem. It only is when like I forget about the Windows use case when I'm just like focused on landing my feature and I'm in a Linux VM. Um, continuous integration is like the savior to all this and I can't tell you how many times um, AppVare has like saved me for something I, I kind of forgot about, um, like on the Windows side. Um, and we've had interesting problems actually with Rust sometimes being faster than we would have thought. Um, we had a, an interesting um, bug with our supervisor really early in its life, and it's basically doing like you know a, an event loop going through a you know an, an infinite loop. In order for it to be fast, we didn't really think about having it block on anything or sleep. And I know for a little while we could not figure out why when we started up our supervisor it was like pinning our CPU. Um, it was just like happily going in this tight loop as fast as it could. It was amazing. So that's like one thing if I was in another language, this probably wouldn't have even occurred to me. Um, so Rust has made um, some of these problems uh, express themselves in a new and surprising ways to me at least. Um, so that, that what that generally boils down to is if there are things that are like potentially racing, like we have a, a gossip subsystem that the supervisor spawns up on a thread and it's like doing its thing and it's updating state and the, the main loop is like consuming updates. Um, we had a, a moment where the supervisor could set itself up faster than the gossip system would, you know, get updates and that kind of thing. So like it, it's led to interesting things where this code runs way faster than I expected it to. Um, I guess we got to think about that. And so, yeah, to wrap up, um, I, I hope I've um, helped to convince you that, like, um, there, you know, have no fear. <laughs> um, try this out. Um, so our Habitat website, the package system and everything, it's written in Rust. It's running under Habitat. It's deployed out there. 
you're going to know if we drop the ball and push some bad software because our website will go away. Um, so we're betting on, on Rust and Habitat ourselves by running it ourselves. That's the best way we can keep ourselves honest. Um, if you're um, still interested in um, looking at uh, either Habitat itself or the, the parts in Rust, I would encourage you to um, join our um, public Slack. So with Habitat, we enjoy uh, puns which don't always translate. If if you're not English speaking, but we have Habitat and Slack, so we call it Habby Slack. Um, and this is where uh, the, like, the, the core team, like for our, the people that are fortunate enough to do Habitat for our day job, um, we use the general channel to like, communicate. So you can see how the Habitat team is working with each other and with members of the community and answering questions throughout our day. It's kind of all there. Um, and we try to sort of keep it that way. So when people are coming in with questions, um, we're literally like answering them as we're answering our like coworkers' questions. So um, with that, um, thank you very much. <laughs>